Welcome course takers to section six, deploying a resilient fault tolerant Pi Global application. Now we've already built quite a resilient application running on resilient infrastructure. So this section takes a, a more detailed look at a couple of optional extras, if you like, things that can help you maybe get more reliability or, or resilience out of your platform. So we'll start looking at EKS or managed Kubernetes on Amazon. Then we'll look at deploying and using Amazon Aurora. And then finally, we'll look at deploying and using App Mesh. So if you're ready, let's get started. So welcome to video number one, running and scaling our application on EKS. So in this video, we'll look at what EKS is. We'll understand why it's important. And then we'll have a couple of demonstrations of tools that will hopefully mean that you really understand the power of Kubernetes and the community around Kubernetes. So if you're ready, let's get going. Now we've used ECS for the majority of this course. Um, personally, I think ECS is a good technology. I hope you've seen that it's very easy to use and there is no real cost to it other than paying for the compute and the storage and the networking that you'd normally use. Um, however, I guess the biggest disadvantage is it is Amazon technology. So it's only on the Amazon cloud and maybe on some of the edge devices that are they're producing now, but it's certainly not as widely adopted as something like Kubernetes. Kubernetes runs on pretty much every cloud and will run on premise if you want, and it will even run on your MacBook if you really want Minikube. It's got a very active community, and that's one of the biggest advantages of Kubernetes. And we'll see from the tooling that I show you that actually that tooling is making life so much easier if you're a developer. It's secure. It doesn't need to be. If you don't configure it securely, then it isn't secure. But using mutual TLS and secrets and RBAC and pod policies and network policies means you can you can build a very secure production service. And I've worked on projects where they're using it in the financial industry in very heavily regulated industries. It's very extensible. So not only can you add and manage the API, you can add in custom resource controllers to do other things. And I think that's one of the biggest advantages when you think about reliability if you need to adopt and change the way that applications are managed in Kubernetes, you can do that. And at the heart of it, which comes back to our reliability engineering aspect, is there is an absolute focus on self-healing, self-correcting, management of pods and containers and services. So it is a platform. So it is a platform that puts reliability at the forefront as well as security. So what does EKS look like? Well, in Amazon, when you get an EKS cluster, you get two VPCs, one that holds the API, and that's what Amazon runs and manages for you. And the other that holds the workloads, the containers, the storage, the networking for your application, and that runs in your VPC. You can have three types of clusters. You can have a publicly accessible cluster where all the endpoints, if not on the internet, they're outside your VPC. So they're certainly running on Amazon's backbone. You can have a private cluster which runs completely within your VPC with no external access at all. And you can have the one that I've built, which is a kind of mixture public and private, where your cluster API is exposed through the internet with some whitelisting and your workers sit on a private node, but they can also be accessed through an ALP. So if I'm an engineer, um, I'm using kubectl or the Kubernetes API to talk to the API layer to configure and build it. When I'm an application user, I'm just talking to the pods through the ALB in the same way that we spoke to ECS. Now, the, I guess the power in Kubernetes is not necessarily the platform. Kubernetes can be difficult to manage. It can certainly be difficult to set up. It's in the tooling that sits around Kubernetes. So we're going to show you two today. Lens, which is a, a relatively new tool. Both of these are open source. Lens, as you see, gives great observability into a cluster and multiple clusters. Quite a new tool, so there's still work to be done on it, but I quite like it. And then Scaffold Revelation. I think when you look at how you could use Scaffold to make changes to running code in your Kubernetes environment and see those changes reflected, you really begin to understand the power that Kubernetes and the, the ecosystem that's building around it can give you. Okay, so let's have a look at the configuration. Let's look at our code first. So we have our EKS code. Um, as I mentioned, EKS is not simple to set up. And you can see we've got a number of files here. Main file sets up the security groups. 
for your Kubernetes cluster, creates your cluster and then all the roles and configuration for that. We then have the worker IAM roles for the worker nodes. We set up the workers themselves. And so that involves setting up some security groups, a launch configuration and a auto scaling group. And we have to plug all that together. So we also have to deploy some configuration into Kubernetes itself. So here's a config map that allows worker nodes to be configured. Now, I'm not going to show you it booting up, configuring, because it does take sort of 20 or 30 minutes to go. If we have a quick look on the console and go into Elastic Kubernetes Service, you can see I've got a cluster here running 1.16. Here are the endpoints. If I look at networking, I can see public and private with a, a white listing address and the various subnets. Um, interestingly, if I look at compute, I don't see anything here. So when EKS first launched, you could only deploy compute through a managed node group, but they're not very scalable or flexible. So on the whole, the way you deploy compute these days is you create an auto scaling group. So if I go into EC2, I can see I've got three running small systems. If I look down at my auto scaling group here, I have with three instances running. Um, and so there's a little bit of work you need to do in order to get these instances to connect back into Kubernetes, uh, the API, things like labeling them, setting up uh, the AWS auth, making sure the security groups allow through the right traffic. So it's not a trivial task. Um, and you can see that the interface is slightly disjointed here. So in the EKS environment, I don't see the compute. And in the compute environment, I don't see the API. So what I really want is something to bring that all together. So Lens is a great little tool. I've been very impressed with it. We started to use it a couple of projects. So here I've got my cluster. I can instantly see my pods, my deployments, stateful sets, daemon sets, jobs. I can drive into looking at the pods. Uh, I can look in more detail, what running, their IPs. Um, I look at my config magnet. Here's the AWS auth. Uh, that are deployed, which basically just starts allowing map roles into EKS worker nodes. Um, I can look at services, look at service accounts, and I can even delete stuff if I want to. So it's a full admin platform, really, and it gives me complete visibility. So here, if I look at my nodes, I can see the nodes. If I have Prometheus running, uh, which is a monitoring system, I would begin to see things like CPU and memory and disk as well. So it gives you a great view of one cluster and of course you can add multiple clusters here uh, so from purely an observability point of view this is starting to to push the the right buttons um, now the thing that i think really excites me is something like scaffold so if i go into my PyCars application all my existing files where i have this thing called scaffold.yaml what scaffold.yaml does is say i'm going to build an artifact so i'm going to build a container and it's called PyCars, and we know if I look at my, if I go back into container registry, this is the registry I want to. So at the moment, I've got tag 001 and latest being configured. So Scaffold is going to build me a container, and then it's going to use Kubernetes manifests, a deployment and a service to actually create those things for me. And if I have a quick look in here, I've got my deployment, basically say how many replicas I want, What's the container called? Here it is. What's the port? And then here's some environment variables that we're passing. So if you remember back to ECS, we had to pass the variables as well. So there's nothing different here. And then my service is just exposing that port out outside the cluster. So nothing, nothing too exciting there. But what I can do is if I run. So if I just type scaffold dev, it's going to look for a container if it's not it's going to build it and now it's going to deploy my application so we can look at lens what we should see is on deployments we've now got a deployment called PyCars. cars i look at pods we're starting to get some pods from the pi car and we can see the registry it's pulling from but we can see that there's a problem so we're getting errors and crash loops, right? So normally I'm trying to debug this, but but actually in my console, I can actually see what we see here, guys, is the live feed from our, our VM, actually, our, our container running. 
and I can see it's having trouble connecting to Amazon. The profile is not set up. It's looking for a default profile. So I know the code. So if I go into our AWS helper uh, and look at that particular part of the code in that create client, if it can't find ECS run or run, detect it's running in Amazon or look for code build, it falls back on using the profile. Of course, there's no profile here. So profile could not be found. So I can change the code, but one of the easiest ways to do this is go into the deployment. And if I just put in ECS run, I'm going to fake it into thinking it's running within ECS at least. And then if I save that, automatically I trigger a new deployment. And this deployment is now with the new code. So it's waiting for changes to come through. And what I should see in Lens is, there we go, containers come up running in Pi cars. Okay, if I go back, we can see that this now sits there waiting for changes. So making changes on code and saving them, Scaffold has not only created the container and then created a deployment and a service, it's when I make changes to the code, it will then manage that process of deploying it again, and I can visually see the changes that are happening. So this is not a replacement for your pipeline. When you get to a certain level of code maturity and you're generating artifacts to be promoted into higher environments like integration or pre-prod or prod, um, then you still need your pipeline there. But here where I'm doing rapid development and as a developer, I really want to see the impact of my code changes quickly running in a production like environment. Scaffolding scaffold is an amazing tool. And I think it's the combination of lens and scaffold that observability and rapid change will help me reduce down the bugs and the errors that I get. And it also means that I'm deploying into uh, a production-like environment. So I shouldn't have too many surprises. If I need a service account or a namespace, then I have to create it for it to work. And then when we want to clear up, I can just type scaffold delete. And it's go off and delete that environment for me. Perfect.